not, then we'll just have to do it the other way. No. with us and stand and sing the potter's hand.
You may be seated. Would you pray with me this morning? Would you be seated today? Father God, I bow before you and I'm reminded as we have just listened to this song that we can do nothing without you. The Bible teaches us how the potter, he would sit at the wheel and mold and shape. And it's so interesting when we watch the potter Lord and how if it's not right, he can completely start over. Taking that ball of clay and though it had been formed and shaped into something, but then it goes back into a mass, into a ball, and then he can begin to mold and shape and reform. And that's a lot like what life is. Because Lord, there are going to be times we feel like that we have got everything going and we are spinning along and then suddenly it comes crumpling around us. Lord, and we are living in a time with a lot of uncertainty. We've been dealing with this. Truth of the matter is, Lord, we've been dealing with this ever since Adam and Eve made a very poor decision. And it's affected all of us. Now, my sin is not blamed upon Adam. But Lee, we like to blame others. We like to look at everyone else to be able to tell what we're doing wrong. Lord, that's where the understanding of salvation comes from is that, first of all, we have to admit that we are sinners and we have failed you and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we do that, then we have taken the first step to understanding, knowing just how badly we need a Savior. So, Lord, today we're going to take a step back as a congregation. To every person who's watching online today, we're going to, I hope and pray as a collective group, we're going to take a step and look around and see what we're really doing. And knowing where you've led me as the pastor of this church and the message you've brought upon my heart today, Lord, you're going to point us in the direction that there's only one thing we can do and we've got to put our eyes back on you. I know we need it as a nation. I know we need it as a state. I know we need it as a church. And as individuals in this room, Lord, I pray that nothing else will matter other than focusing completely upon you today. So, Lord, take everything. And as we have started completely on the right foot, not knowing what I was going to preach, but, Lord, what Christian has led us, we are going to now understand and pray that prayer, Lord, to take me, mold me, make me, and use me. I give my life to the potter's hand. And allow it to be, Lord, where we are completely focused upon you, starting right this very moment. I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. It's so good to see you this morning. I hope and pray God's bless you this weekend. So glad you've chosen to join with us here in person. And for those of you that are joining us online, we are so glad to have you in worship with us this morning. We're looking forward to a great day. It's an absolutely beautiful day outside. And I want to welcome those of you that are guests today. I'm not seeing any guests from where I'm standing, but that does not change the fact that if you are a guest and I've overlooked you, that we are glad that you're here. You should have picked up a bulletin when you came in today, and there's a little portion on there that says, Welcome to Daleville. And when the pastor printed the bulletins this week, he decided to do it upside down. So what you're going to get to do is cut out, take out your fingernail clippers, or you're going to take out your scissors, or your scripto pen, or whatever you want to do, and you can slide that off if you're a visitor here today, and you can give it to us at the end of the service so we can have a record of your visit. But now what it's going to give you to do is going to give you the opportunity to look at the bottom where there are prayer requests that are right there that is in a perfectly perforated part. So you can be able to submit that at the end of the service if you have one so we can have that for our Wednesday night service. And we can be able to obviously move forward for those things that God has laid upon your heart. Now, I do that to poke a little fun at myself because I'm the one that did it, 100% me. And uh, I, you might as well, that way nobody talks about you. I'm the one talking about it. Everybody makes sense? Okay, good. Everybody do like this and we're ready to go. So, again, it is great to have you here this morning. i got a few things that I'm going to let you know at the end of the service today that you can be praying about and what you need to know about. But we're going to worship now. So I'm going to ask if you would to stand together as Christian and our team continue to lead us today. Please stand as we continue to worship, singing Days of Elijah.
very special.
absolutely wonderful job. And could you tell the story that was told right there? Because you have got everything from the journey to heaven, to the blood of Jesus, to the church in the wild wood, to what a day that will be. And what an absolutely wonderful job you guys did. Thank you, ladies, for your willingness to play to our Savior this morning. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, as our children are going to children's church this morning, we're going to turn to the gospel as recorded by Matthew, chapter 14. As Miss Heather's moving into place, uh, Miss Darby, turn me down here just a grunt. On the, there, that's going back, it's going to do a little bit. I think it's here, Brother Steve, not you. So, they are ready to go. I have here in, on, my, on the pulpit, uh, we have a watch that was left downstairs in the dining area on Wednesday night. And it could be a child's watch, it could be a lady's watch, but I have that here for you after the service if you are missing your watch. And I would be remiss today if I did not let you know that the beautiful flowers today are giving in memory of Melanie Connell by her dad, Mr. Ricky. And Mr. Ricky, we continue to pray for you. It was an absolutely beautiful service. For your daughter this past week and uh well to be honest with you i know it's uh it's, a, it's been a tough week for you but we thank you for the beautiful flowers and what a testimony she gave an absolutely great job by those that were involved in that service this week so that kind of leads me in to be honest with you where we want to go today because um as a i'm a, i think y'all learned me by now i'm a, I'm a preacher that i like to build on things and i like to know I need to have a plan of where we're going. And to be honest with you, when we finished with baptism of the Lord's Supper over the past couple of weeks, knowing we're about to go into Christmas stuff here in the next week or two, I'm kind of in a place of, all right, God, I don't know where you want me to go. And I've struggled with this this week. I'm just going to be very blunt with you. Uh, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. Um, when this happened with Melanie Monday, and then their funeral was Thursday. Uh, some of you don't know this, but I had a funeral of a relative, a 96-year-old. I called her Aunt Marilyn, even though I it's one of those aunts that, yes, she's my aunt, but yes, I don't I don't know her kind of a thing. And I was asked as uh, as a representative of the family to go to Troy yesterday and do a funeral. And um, the time became limited. But then I've watched, I learned in school. There's some things that you get to do that you need to pay attention to. And again, I don't pay attention to all of it, but when you go to Baptist College of Florida or Florida Baptist Theological College as it was back in 2000 when I graduated, they said there's two things you need to have on your desk at all times. You need to have a newspaper and you need to have the Bible. Not necessarily in that same order. Um, newspapers are a little bit obsolete. I know y'all get a lot of them, but I don't have a newspaper at my house, but I do have the internet. And I try to be relevant to what's going on in the world. And when all this stuff started back in March, God led me on a kind of a journey there because we didn't know how long it was going to be. And not right now, we're still doing online services and we're still in a position of we're about 60% of where we should be. I got to sit down last night with a gentleman who's looking for a church and telling him where we are. And I was honest with him. I said, we have, if I'm going to be honest with you, I said, we have a Zoom Sunday school class, which we didn't get to do today due to Bill and Angela having COVID. And I, I, I'm just letting you guys know, Trey just found out. If you did not look at your bulletin or we're not here Wednesday, Bill Fillmore is, and, and, and Miss Angela have, have contracted the virus. That is the first couple, the first people in our church who have contracted it. And you need to pray for them because they're weak. They're strong, but they're weak. I cut up with Bill the other day and he said, I'm going to go take a shower, then I'm going to take a nap. Because that's about all you got. So I've looked at this and then you got... You look outside of it and what's happening in our world. We got three weeks from an election and we don't know which way it's going to go. Not only that, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. Doggone, Nick Saban got COVID. I mean, sort of. The president got COVID-19. We got all this uncertainty in our world. And then I look inside of our walls and knowing what happened to Ricky and Miss Kay this week and knowing what's happened to Tom and Katie Mack and not only that, I extend from the weeks back. God pointed me back to something. He said, Jim, he calls me Jim. What do you think the problem is? And I said, Lord, I, I don't know, but I know that there's, when people ask me how it's going, here's what I tell them. 
feels like I'm treading water. Does anybody else in this room feel that way? Please raise your hand. Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one. For those of you that couldn't see that online, there was a lot of folks in this room. And he revealed to me Friday afternoon and he confirmed it this morning. We've taken our eyes off of Jesus. Now I want to make this very clear. There are people who are not coming back to our church right now because of the concern they have and what their doctors have told them to do. And I'm telling you that you need to advise, do what your doctors have advised you to do. It's been said from this pulpit that we need to just forget everything and come on back. Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that we're in a position to move anything because we have right now 25 in Sunday school through a Zoom class. And I don't know that anybody's ready to move back into small rooms yet. I don't know that I'm ready for us to move back into small rooms yet. I don't know. Sunday night, that would mean recleaning the sanctuary. And I, that's not there. Wednesday night, we can do it into a place where we have been safe so far. And that's the only thing I can think of is safe. And I know this, though. That if we have our eyes off of on, on anything other than Christ, then we're going to be in a constant state of worry, which is where I found myself since March. I'm being as brutally honest as I know how this morning. So this morning, I'm going to share with you the message you've heard from me the most since I've been your pastor here, because this is a funeral message. This is a message I've, I've shared, and most of you in the room can give me the points. And I felt like it was exactly where God would have us to be. We have been filled with anxiety, worry, stress, and fear. We as a world, a nation, and probably as a church are scared of something. It doesn't have to be COVID-19. It could be dying. It could be of being alone. It could be of uh, without the way of change. It could be anything. And the moment that that anxiety, that fear, that worry comes into our lives, what we have done is exactly what the disciples did on the middle of the sea one night. In this particular chapter, you are following one of the more unbelievable events that have ever taken place in the history of the world. Because... One after the other in chapter 14 of the of book of Matthew, which is one of the most important ones because of what took place. You go from John the Baptist being beheaded because the king at the time was aroused by a woman that was tremendously younger than him. And she, he said, whatever you want, I'm going to give you. So she said, I'd like John the Baptist's head on a platter. And he had no choice but to do it. And then you're met with the disciples looking around and they're walking into a mass of people, at least 5,000 men, but we're not even counting the women and children. So you're looking at least 15,000 people that Jesus fed because of a little boy's lunch. So you go from an awful thing to an amazing thing. And then the Bible says immediately Jesus sent his disciples to the other side, put them in a boat and sent them away. So now you're going from bad to good to bad again because they are now separated from Jesus for the first time in two and a half years. Not to mention he sends them in a boat which is probably no bigger than a skiff at best. It's certainly not a sailboat or a cruise ship or a yacht or by any stretch of the imagination. It's probably enough to put about 15 people in. And he sends them, he says in verse, four, in verse 12, uh, to verse 22 of, first, of chapter 14, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. He got them out of the crowd so he could send the crowd away. And I imagine he's there healing. I imagine he's there touching them. I imagine he's there loving them until he got to a place where he could go then by himself up on a mountain to pray. And then when the evening came, he was alone. And the boat then by this time was in the middle of the sea. And the Bible says it was about three to four o'clock in the morning. So you got to think about what all is happening here. And then it is at this moment in verse 25 that the Bible says that Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. I'd imagine they were. Because first of all, if you're in the middle of a sea storm, 
at this particular moment in time on a skiff with no lights in the middle where you can't see a thing and then suddenly you see an old boy standing up there on top of the sea, I think I'd be troubled a little bit too. So there they are. And there he is. And they have no idea it's him. But then he says what he says 365 times in some capacity in God's word. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter, with the audacity of Peter that sometimes he does. He said, Lord, if that's really you, command me to come out on the water to you. And Jesus said, come. And then Peter began walking on water to Jesus. Now, it is at this moment, especially in a funeral service, that I have broken this down and put it into a place where there are three specific things that I want you to notice. And I'm going to ask you today to indulge me because I'm probably, this is one of those things where I have to follow notes, but it's probably pretty raw from where it's coming from because I know we're afraid. When I say we, I have to take the collectiveness of it because whatever you're afraid of when it comes to the future, there's concern there. Whatever it is, maybe you are in our past, we're concerned there. In our present, there's a lot of us that are concerned there because we find ourselves not unlike where the disciples were. Alone, it seems like, in the middle of a raging sea storm and there is no land in sight and we are looking around trying to find a way out of this mess. And we don't know what to do. I try very hard to not repeat myself when it comes to the things that I preach about because, to be honest with you, it shows sometimes I'm afraid that people think that I don't prepare or are not ready to be able to do it. But there are certain times that God points you back to things that, to be honest with you, that have made sense before and maybe will make sense again. My previous pastor would call them sugar sticks because you go to them and you know they're sweet every time. This is one of those moments and one of those things that, to be honest with you, if I walked into a crowd of people and they looked at me and said, Brother Jim, why don't you preach us something to us? I would pull this out because I know how to preach it. I know what this Bible says. I know what it says right here because everything about it that we do is not just something that I can preach and pull up in memory. It's something that we live. It is real. It is happening because, folks, we're in the middle of a storm. And there is nothing sometimes to do better other than to just drift along and tread water. Because that's what they're doing. And you've got to think about what they're dealing with. We're talking about the Sea of Galilee that this is dealing with. And they're not in the middle of something where the waves are nice. and No, we are talking about waves that are coming up over the boat. It is coming inside. And the fact of the matter is, is you've got fishermen on the boat and they're still afraid. So think about it. They're in the middle of this and they're talking about life or death. But then Jesus comes walking on the sea. This is the, probably the oldest message that I have. And I tell you this from the standpoint of trying to make it to understand that we know this. That if we have our eyes on Jesus, first of all, there is nothing to fear. That is hard to say in a mess like we're in. Because we have got all this raging up around us. But that's exactly what was happening to them. They were so afraid. They thought, first of all, they were alone. Because Jesus sent them to the other side. So he was not with them. And all they knew is, for some reason, and I just don't understand it, why they would go without Jesus in the first place. They went everywhere else. But Jesus, being their teacher, sent them by themselves. And I don't know how they thought he was going to get there. I don't know what they thought about it from the standpoint of how Jesus was going to get from where he was to where they were. But to be honest with you, the storm was so much, they didn't even think about it. They had, that was out their mind. So they were alone. And then they were afraid because of the storm itself. I want to read for you something. This is Acts chapter 27. This is an account that Paul said about the sea of Galilee and the storms that they faced. Listen. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. And on the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now there was neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat upon us. And all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. That's Paul. He thought he was dying. Now, I don't know if it's the same kind of storm, but I'm going to tell you this. If you're alone and you're afraid in the middle of a storm and then you're to a place where they were and you're all out of options... I mean, that's what he's throwing stuff overboard. They were in a position where so many of us are. What are we going to do now? 
What are we going to do? Because if we could go fix some things, we'd fix it. But the problem is, is we fix one thing and somebody else has got another opinion about how to fix it too. And that don't make any difference what you put into because all of us are in a position that we are trying to do some things ourselves that we're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, our author and finisher of our faith to complete. And then you get ahead. And then what you got? A mess. We're in a Christian nation, supposedly, but we're not acting very Christian. And we can say an awful lot of stuff about it. A lot of people like to hide behind their keyboards and talk about these things, but then they get on there and the truth of the matter is, is we're doing a lot of talking, but we're not doing a lot of praying. We find ourselves at exactly the same place where they are. But then, then, then Jesus came walking on the sea. I'm so glad Jesus shows up when we need him to and not early and not late. Listen to this. He sent them there. He made them get in the boat. That means that he knew there was a storm coming and he knew they were going to get to the other side because he sent them to the other side. And in sending them to the other side, that means he was going to get there. So if nothing else, when they put him in the boat, he knew what was going to happen even if they didn't. And by putting them in the boat and sending them to the other side, however way he chose to get there, he got there. Because I don't know if he sent the disciples or sends the, sends the crowds away, went up the mountain by himself to pray, and then he ran across the sea. I don't know if he transported himself across the sea. I don't know if it took eight, nine hours to get from where he was to where they were, and they had dropped anchor trying to, I don't know. But what I know is this, he was not there, and then he was there. So the Bible is correct by saying he, so he can look into the hills from where our help comes from our help comes from the lord the maker of heaven and earth so we know this to be true is that wherever he is we are wherever we are there he is also even though we may not see him even though it's dark and it is storming and it is raging and we don't know what to do that means that even though we don't know where jesus is he's always known where we are always so we have nothing to fear because Jesus has always been there. Secondly, when you got your eyes on Jesus, you can do anything. Anything. Peter looks at him and said, Lord, if that's really you. Now, again, I don't know, but all I know is he recognized the voice of Christ at this moment. And Peter saying something, he said, okay, if that's really you, then you command me to come out there on the water to you because I, there's no other way I can do it. And when he heard come, I think Peter jumped out the boat. I really do. I think that he knew it because let me tell you something. What I know is whenever Jesus is, there is always peace. So that is the only peaceful spot that was happening in that water right then. And he would, I do not believe Jesus was riding the waves. I do not believe Jesus was in a position to where he was having to adjust himself. I believe Jesus was standing right in the middle of the sea. And that is the only peaceful spot that there was, was right where he was. And all I knew is Peter said to himself, look, I know what's happening here, but I'm going to go there. And he said, Lord, if that's really you, command me to come to you. And by the way, he's the only one who got out the boat. Only one. So he gets out of the boat. And he walks on the water to Jesus. He defies gravity. He defies the laws of nature. He defies everything that God has given us. And he walks up there to him. Right in the middle of all this mess. That's where he was. Peter walked on wonder. Walked on water. So that tells me that you and I can find peace in the middle of an absolutely unbelievable situation. God will give us the strength to do what we think we cannot. Which is sometimes make it. Which is sometimes put our one foot in front of the other. Which is sometimes get up and breathe. And the thing is, is it doesn't make any difference who it may be or what situation it is. Anytime we think something is not possible, I want to remind you, with man it is not, but with God all things are possible. So whatever you're going through right now, it is not a matter of going out there and saying, you know what, I'm, like, I'm going to destroy coronavirus. I'm going to go outside and lick a flagpole or something. That's just dumb. I don't know why licking a flagpole has anything to do with coronavirus, but that's what popped in my head. But we go out into this world today and we think to yourself, it ain't going to make any difference. No, this thing is real. Call Bob, Bill, and Angela and ask them how real it is. 
Call my friend Jay and his wife Amy who have had it. Tell them how it is. We got all these people online thinking it's not real. Look, folks, it's real. But so is the flu. So is doing dumb stuff to cause yourself to get sick. So is running in the side of the wall and thinking it won't hurt. You don't do dumb stuff. We have to live in a world where it is, and this is one of those things that we know that they have either reacted or overreacted in such a way to where we have got to make changes in our life. And I learned this past Monday and I'm reminded, what we're establishing right now is our new normal. Think about it. We don't go back to the way things used to be because we're always changing. We should be. And let me tell you something. I'm ready to fight. 2021, I'm going to just tell you right now, you don't normally do this in October, but I know where God's leading us. We're going to start out with the full armor of God. As soon as January, the first Sunday of January comes, full armor of God is going to start to be put on us. And then we're going to look at the, at the life of a warrior because if we're going to fight, we need to see what it looks like. So we're going to be looking at the life of David. We're going to be looking at it from the moment that we put on the full armor. I don't know if I'm going to put, I may have everything in the world on here. I may have a football uniform. I may have the full garb of a Roman soldier. I don't know, but we're going to make sure you understand it because that helmet of salvation, that, that belt, that breastplate, those shots, all that stuff, we need it because we've got to fight to be in this world. Because I want to tell you something. As Christians, we are becoming less and less relevant. Why? Because we are satisfied with silence. I'm tired of being silent. I have never been a silent person, and you can amen that. <laughs> it's time to fight. So I'm going to do the impossible today. I want to do what my Bible tells me, and I know that I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I have that power because I got Jesus in me. So I'm going to put my eyes on Jesus. I know I will not all the time, but at some point or another, then he may call me to walk on water. I guarantee you won't because it happened one time. It only happened one way. He may never ask me to do certain things that have been done in the Bible. But if he's able to tell me to do it, I know that I can get through the impossible because Jesus is there. But here's where the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen. The reason why I know that I, if I have my eyes on Jesus, I won't sink is because of exactly what Peter did. It's when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. First of all, he's alive in the middle of all this mess. Second of all, he is walking on water. And then the Bible says very clearly that he saw that the wind was boisterous. That's what New King James says. It may say blowing it may say the waves were high i don't know what version you have but verse 30 says when he saw that the wind was boisterous he was afraid he was afraid and then he began to sink he lost his faith he lost his impossibleness because he took his eyes off of what he was doing and either looked down or looked around and he said oh my what is going on and then he dropped like a rock. No wonder we're in the mess that we're in. Because we have forgotten to be looking at the author and finisher of our faith. That's why Jesus told us in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. And he goes further to say, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And let me tell you this. If I'm going to go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to receive it in myself that where I am, you may be also. He said that. We talked about it every Wednesday night. And you, let me tell you something. We are living in a world right now where we've got a lot of people. And if you are sick, if you are susceptible, then I want you to remain there. But if we got people at home and you're in your pajamas and you're in a position where you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm just going to do church here today. You cannot have the fellowship with the people that are here if you're there. So we've got in a position, if you're using it as an excuse, you cannot be walking on water like we're supposed to be because we need you. But until that time, I'm going to be putting it right here to tell you that we love you and we miss you and we want to see you here. Because I miss you as your pastor. You are missing this face in beautiful H3D that doesn't do what it does in real life. Now listen. I'm doing it to be funny, but the truth of the matter is, is if we're making excuses, and I don't care if it's church, I don't care if it's anything, if we're making excuses, we got our eyes on Jesus, off of Jesus. <coughs> Period. And the moment we take it off, I mean, we will sink. 
I normally, I, I'm going to be very careful not to pinpoint here, but we got folks in here that are literally in the middle of that storm, and you know who you are. The storm is raging, and you do not see light. You do not see, I need, I need Jesus to be here. Let me remind you. He sent him to the other side. He put us there in purpose. He knew the storm was coming, and he said, you will go to the other side. So you put your eyes on Jesus. And when we do, even when we fail, he's still there. Oh, thank God. Because the moment that he sank, what did Jesus do? He reached down. He pulled him up and put him in the boat. And then the seas stopped. Did y'all see that? He healed him in the middle of it and said, why did you doubt me? And then the sea was calm and they then worshiped him. That tells me that language in verse 33 says, then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him. Where did they come to? They came together. They just gathered up in a holy huddle. And whoever was doubting at that moment suddenly believed. That tells me that somebody in those 12 disciples did not believe what was going on. And they said, truly, you are the Son of God. That could be Judas. That could be Thomas. That could be any of them. So today, the message is simple. We have got to keep our eyes on Jesus. If you do... There is no reason to fear. You can do anything and you will not. You cannot sink. So today I leave you with the words of the songwriter. Her name was Helen L. Lamel. She's the daughter of a Methodist minister. She immigrated to England with her family to America when she was 12 years old. And she penned these words. I believe this passage is truly what inspired her. Her words simply say this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. What are you looking at? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. In just a moment, Dr. Stamps is going to start to play. I'm going to ask you to, this invitation time, let me remind you. Today, it is a simple call that there's people all across this room, you are worried. You are concerned. You are in fear. And you are afraid. If you have a prayer request at this time for somebody else, I'm going to ask you to write it down and let me be able to have it so I can truly pray for them. But if you're in a position this morning and you need me to pray for you as your pastor, I want to do it. Maybe you're in this room today and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord because you have been afraid and you cannot do this by yourself and you've been looking at everything else. You need to come forward and let me pray with you. But this altar is here for the simple purpose of being able to come forward and to bow before him in a symbolic gesture to say, Lord God, I need you. Oh God, I need you. Every hour I need you. So maybe you need to just come to this altar. You may be in this room today and you've never been a member of a church and you need a church family to surround you. You need to come forward this morning and let me ask you a couple of simple questions so you may come be a part of this family of believers. Or perhaps you're in this room this morning and you need to come forward and you say, I need Jesus as my Savior because I can't see Him. I can't find Him. And I'm afraid and I don't know what else to do. So what I'm doing now today is asking Jesus to be my Savior. 
And if I ask Him to be my Savior, we have to do the very first thing is to admit that I'm a sinner. And by doing so then, then I believe that Jesus is God's Son. You believe on the Son of God. And then you then commit your life unto Him. Doing that, the Bible says that He will never leave you nor forsake you. That says that He will be with you through thick and thin. And that means that He will even be there when you can't see Him. It is at this moment that we're going to offer this invitation time for those who need to be right with God. And if you need it at this moment, if there's nobody that comes, that's fine. But we're going to come to a position where this is the time. And if you're afraid, then my question is, what are you looking at? Maybe you need to be in a position to say, God, I'm sorry. And I'm going to put my eyes back on you. If that's you, this is the time for you. Dr. Stamps is going to play. I'm going to ask you to very quietly stand to your feet all across this room. I'm going to ask you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to pray and I'm going to walk to the front. If in just a minute nobody comes, then we're going to close. I'm going to do a couple announcements and we're going to get ready for Wednesday. But if somebody comes, you pray for them. And if it's you, we're going to take the time needed to be able to help us put our eyes back where they should be. Father God, I come before you today with a simple asking of this prayer. Is that Lord, you lead us and you guide us. And Lord, you help us put our eyes upon you. Lord, if there's someone in this room who does not know you as Savior, give them the strength today to come forward. And then Lord, by your holy power, the Spirit that's inside of you, you're going to give them the strength to know that every day now with you is sweeter than the day before. And it will draw it because of salvation that you gave for us on the cross. Lord, there's someone here today that has simply took their eyes off of you. Let them have the strength to come forward and say, I need help. Help me, pray for me to put my eyes back where they should be. We ask it all in your name. And bow eyes closed all across this room today as Dr. Stamps plays. share something that Stephanie just shared with me and I think it's where a lot of people are. She said, Brother Jim, I believe in Jesus but I'm still afraid. Now that's as real and raw as it gets. Not everybody's afraid every moment of every day. I know that. But I know this. Whenever junk happens, you ever had junk happen? <laughs> and it shakes our faith. And that's I think when we take our eyes off of it. So for those of you that have lost in this room, who are hurting, who are struggling, we need to be reminded that we need those prayers. We, need, we can't stop praying for one another. 
and lifting them and loving them because they need it. And just because they're not on a prayer list or just because of that's what sustains us. And then if we see it happen, don't be afraid to look over to somebody and say, listen, I love you. But you got your eyes on something else. I think we've been silent too long. So, for the love of Jesus, I tell you today, that's what I'm here for. If you need me to just blow some steam, I'll blow right back at you. Help you is what we're here for is to put our eyes because we have to walk in this until he calls us home or until he comes back. We show the Lord's death till he comes. Y'all remember that? Every day. I got a couple things to remind you. Thank you, first of all, for your attention today, for being here. Thank you, Facebook, for joining us. Ms. Vivian Lambert right now is in Atlanta. She has a follow up appointment with her cancer doctor tomorrow. It's very important. We need to be reminded that uh, she wants to be a report. God has done amazing things with that woman who we know with what she had, she should be gone. You need to know also that she met Alex is back in the hospital in Enterprise, having the same breathing problems. She's in a regular room. She has been in ICU some this week, but she's in a regular room right now. There are no visitors that allow other than one a day. And when you make that one visit, if you're there for 10 minutes, then you wipe somebody else coming the rest of the day. So we're, as much as she would love to see people, don't go see her. Okay? That's just kind of the way it is right now. I'll be dark. A couple of y'all may have noticed, Brother Jordan is not here this morning. He was the best man at a wedding yesterday, so he is visiting with his family. He will be back next week. But I will get to make this wonderful announcement, and many of you know it. Brother Jeremy Metz, who was our former youth minister here, he gets married this coming Saturday. And uh, Benita and I had the privilege of going up and witnessing that and looking forward to that time. So y'all pray for him and his new bride-to-be, which will be this coming Saturday. Next Sunday night, we have a very special time where we normally would have a fall festival. We're part of the solution, not the problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to have family movie night. We're going to have some popcorn. We're going to have some hot dogs. That's going to start at 5.30. It's going to be outside. If it's freezing cold, bring a blanket. <laughs> if it's raining, what if it's cold? It's October. It's supposed to be. <laughs> if it's raining, we will postpone to another time. We're going to have a great time. Bring a lawn chair. We have a thing set up. It's going to be a great time. Come. Come. You will have a great time. Bring people with you. Okay, that's next Sunday night. We will be having trunk or treat on Halloween night. We will do it for an hour from 6 to 7. We're going to social distance with our cars all over the parking lot. Because <laughs> we have more people that come on our campus during that time than any other time. So we're going to take advantage of this. You're going to get, if I get it done, we're going to get to see an ad this week in the paper and my continued horrible picks of college football and things in there. And those of you that keep making fun, but we have a great opportunity to advertise for that this week. So we encourage you to be here and keep telling people to keep your eyes on Jesus. Do it by the way you live your life. I've just been reminded, and many of you know, Brother Chad Hickson, who is a former pastor at Providence Baptist, who is now at uh, Rehoboth Baptist Church. He and his son have contracted COVID. So we need to be in prayer for them. Look at the bottom of your sheet today. You see those who, have, uh, of course, we're continuing to pray for and those who have things that are going on this week, and that is on your bulletin this morning. I love you. I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Let's bow together and we will be dismissed. Yes, ma'am. Miss Martha. That answer to that question is, is we would love to have the candy for that. Yes, ma'am. We normally have it way in advance, but we had to make the decision based upon what the city did. And they let us know that in the past few days. So if you've got candy to bring, we would appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Let's pray, let's pray together. Brother Ike, if you would pray for us as we dismiss today.